maximum energy stored between those flakes. And um, up here you can see that point it results in maximum uplift. Footnote here. These points, these black points, are all from Nepal. And Nepal has the distinction of being the first country in Asia to adopt GPS measurements. Before India, before China, before Bangladesh and Pakistan. Okay? They are still secret in India and Pakistan, I mean uh, China. Despite the fact that many cars have GPS navigators. The precise measurement of GPS to millimeter accuracy is regarded as a secret. This is so absurd. This is one of the anomalies in military thinking that um, you know nobody in the military wants to admit they, they, there is absolutely no value in knowing where you are to a millimeter position, but quite a lot of use in knowing where you are on a road, which is what they allow. So this is an absurd, but. Nepal was, a, was a sensible enough to permit these measurements to start 20 years ago. And as a result, we know an enormous amount of information. This leveling line was measured even before that using spirit leveling along the roads of Nepal. And what it says is that the mountains of Nepal are rising at 3 to 5 millimeters a year. Okay? They, between earthquakes, the squeezing motion of India and Tibet squeezes up the rocks elastically. That is the storage region where all this is happening. And we know that we can interpret that very simply. Here is this, this line, this vertical line, and centered over that blue line on the ground, 18 kilometers deep, the lucky line. And that's where all the elastic energy is stored. North of that line, India slides, creeps underneath to that at 18 millimeters a year. It's almost as though somebody has a can of created by oil and pumping it in all the time so there's no friction. So India is sliding continuously there, however here it's locked. It's locked. And there's the blue locking line which is the northern point of this one. This violet region is where the big earthquake will occur. Okay? Let, get that jump chain in mind and I'll show you mechanically what's happening. This, this is the locking line. This is where the earthquake is going to occur. And I'm going to take you in 30 year increments. So here are 30 years after the first earthquake 60, um, 90, 120, 150, 180, and you've suddenly reached a critical stress. So you can see how this is an elastic strain. This is compression causing the mountains to rise and extension in the Indian plate. And the backstop is Tibet. Tibet is not moving out of the way. That's, and, and, and in fact, the force from that is what's keeping Tibet five kilometers high. So it's a very simple thing. Now, when it reaches this critical stress, the strength of the rocks holding that stress is exceeded. And you get a sudden earthquake, which happens like this in about one second. Okay? This is the violence of the elastic strain release. Now, the mountains that were going up have now gone down, and the region to the south has gone up. In fact, what normally happens in a big earthquake here, we call it a great earthquake, it's greater than eight, is that this whole package of rocks, the Himalaya, the Kathmandu Valley is hanging on it, breaks the, uh, through the front surface as a rupture. It actually forms a crack. And I'm going to show you a picture of the crack in 1505. It's been excavated here. Um, this is a, a man who's standing on a lag of This is an enormous trench across the rupture that occurred in 1505. And you can't really see, but perhaps you can, there's a soil layer here, and it goes out to around there. And you can see another soil layer that comes in here, and this point used to be joined to there, and this distance is 23 meters, which is the amount that, that the rupture allowed or occurred in 1505. 23 meters. This room is uh, 10 meters long. It's the twice as long as this room. Okay? And the rupture, it actually came up a plane like this and would have gone into the air briefly, 
with the trees, and then it sunk down. <coughs> and all the trees were tilted at the time, because these trees are, are descendants of those original trees, which is 500 years later, and then all the rest. But this would have been what somebody walking along the Terrine in 1505 would have seen. Now, <laughs> that sounded like an aftershock to me. <laughs> India cannot go underneath Tibet unless that occurs. So something is wrong. Okay, and this is another aspect of this earthquake that where geologists and seismologists did not expect. We're seeing something new. The book is still being written about this earthquake as we as we sit here in, in Kathmandu. It's not over yet. So let me just ram that home. This is what we expect. The Himalayas being blocked between earthquakes that creep to occur beneath uh, Tibet. And when an earthquake occurs, the violent region carries all that stress to the front and dissipates it by moving rocks and trees and this, that, and the other. What happened in this earthquake is it was an incomplete rupture. It fizzled out just south of you. So here's, here's my reason, reasoning why this may have fizzled out. In 1934, it did make it to the front. We've dug it up, we found the dates, we even found a previous earthquake from the same rupture, 1255. Okay. We know that released 12 meters of slip. And this earthquake only released 3 meters of slip. So the amount of slip was not enough at the back end to make it to the front end. Now, I'm going to give you an analogy where I have to think about a thought experiment because there's something strange about these earthquakes. Imagine you have a brick, and uh, you can all remember what a brick looks like, it's all red colored, it's about that size, uh, about this thick, and about that long. And I'm just going to give you some numbers. It's four inches high, it's ten inches long. Now let's imagine a gigantic brick, four miles high and ten miles long. And I'm going to push it, and in fact, if I've got enough force, I can actually move it. And it's got ten miles of brick in contact with the concrete floor, and I'm pushing it over the entire four mile height with all sorts of gigantic hydraulic rams. I can actually move that brick, okay? It takes a big force, but I can do it. Now here's the problem. If you add another 10 miles of brick at the front, I'm just putting another brick there, and you push with your brick at the back, you can't make it move, because the friction now is too big. Okay? And this is the problem, the, the central paradox of Himalayan earthquakes. They cannot move because the friction is too high. I'll say that again because you, you heard me correctly, but I want to reinforce it. The Himalaya cannot move southwards over India because the friction is too high underneath it. And this, of course, is nonsense because I've just told you how it works. It does slip, and yet it cannot slip. So what is the problem? What is the solution? The solution is that for a fraction of a second, you have to reduce the friction beneath the Himalaya to zero. Close to zero when doing it. It has to be zero. Now, you might say, well, this is ridiculous. What is he talking about? Well, we could put ball bearings there. But if there were ball bearings under the Himalaya, the Himalaya would slide all the time. There wouldn't be any other things. We know it's locked. We could do the same with water, we could float it and push it. But we have to have an instantaneous mechanism to reduce the friction from what it is before the earthquake to zero during the earthquake and to back to now what it is, which is very high. So I'm giving you a paradox because this is the sort of thing scientists struggle with. I'm now going to give you the answer how it works. I'm going to ask you to think about a carpet. Okay? If you want to move a carpet, you know what you'll do is 
pick it up and, and drag it. But the earth doesn't want it, it can't just drag, it has to push. It's pushing from the back. And if I push this carpet, I think your the thought experiment will tell you what happens. It simply rumps, rumples up, it ripples at the back. You can't actually make the front move. But you also know if you get your carpet and you go like that, a ripple runs through the carpet and it increments forward an inch, two inches, whatever. That's how carpet people move big carpets around. They, they do that, they, they flick it, and a ripple runs along. Now, what that ripple is, is a point in the carpet is not in contact with the ground, and when it comes back, it's moved a little bit, it's like a caterpillar. Okay, it's actually moving like a caterpillar along the ground. Now, that is how we know this earthquake propagates. It's almost impossible to believe, uh, but I'll show you what actually happened. And the speed of which it This is a map view that's happened to, here's the epicenter in Gulfa, and um, the Terra is down here, and um, Everest is over here somewhere on this map. Uh, blue is one meter of slip, red is uh, well, up to four meters of slip. Now, what you can't really see is there are little contours here. Okay, each one is a contour of five second intervals. This is constructed from uh, teleseismic information recorded all around the world. We can actually see what happened in this earthquake. The local seismometers don't see it because they are thrown around, they're off scale all the time. But this is now well established. I'll show you another view in a minute. But let's just see what happened. Look, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 seconds later, after the earthquake, the rupture has reached Kathmandu. Okay? We have a number now, 35 seconds. We have a distance, it's about 40 kilometers. The velocity is 2.4 kilometers per second. Okay, that's how much small number. Let's convert it to miles per hour. 5,600. 5,600 miles an hour is the speed at which the ripple came towards you. Okay, that's the, the ripple pulse, which reduces the friction to zero and allows the Himalaya to slip. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Fantastic physical idea to think about. This actually happened right underneath you and Kathmandu and everything in it, you included, all the buildings, all the temples, moved 1.8 meters to the southwest. Okay, you were here before the earthquake, five seconds later you were here, 1.8 meters away. Everything moved in five seconds. The other thing about this plot is it shows that 5,600 mile an hour thing suddenly slowed to half the velocity when it reached Kathmandu. Again, why this happened, we do not know. This is the ripple pulse losing energy. There's dissipation as it travels. And as it slows, fortunately for Kathmandu, it meant that the accelerations here were much less than they would otherwise have been. Why? I don't know. I don't know. This is an observation. It's just fantastically fortunate. This, and it's fortunate for another reason, and that is that when a, 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 an earthquake wave propagates towards you, there are three waves involved, the P wave, the S wave, and the surface wave, plus this ripple pulse. And they were all coming to you at different velocities, and they should have all arrived at Kathmandu at the same time, therefore making the acceleration much, much, much greater. It's called directivity. You had directivity in spades in this earthquake. This was absolutely amazing. If somebody said you're going to have directivity as well, people would have said total destruction, death toll, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. People, seriously, there's no, you know, everything we know would, would have forecast doom and destruction. In fact, most of the buildings are still standing, meaning that something very wrong happened. Now here is a, another view of what went on. This is a, a, a different scientist, a different process back projection, you don't have to know about it. But what this says is that the main rupture went northwards into Tibet in the first 10 seconds. Then another rupture started propagating towards you, this ripple pass is happening to, and, and that started about um, 20 seconds, well, about 17 seconds after the main shot, and it arrived at 35 um, seconds later. Here in Kathmandu. Shortly after, was, there was a large aftershock which 